the San Diego Apple Pie Home Society. So I was like heavy duty into it at that time. And still am for the most part. When I moved back here, and I'd lived in Albuquerque before, so I knew what I was getting into. When we moved back to retire, um, I brought like close to 200 episodes of cacti with me. Mostly as cutting. They're now getting bigger, and I'm going, what the heck was I thinking? <laughs> because I have way more than I need. I have a small greenhouse, and I have a bunch of uh, holiday cacti that I'm growing again now. Uh, the one in the, uh, in the green pot there, I think I've had that one going for about two years now. So, and there's three different kinds in that one. And that other little pot there is a true Christmas pack. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we go. Let's see, where's the down? Um, there are 16 epithetic cacti uh, genera, um, and these are the various genuses. The uh, two that I'm going to talk about tonight are the Ripsalidopsis and the Sumbergera or some verdura, however you want to say it. I, I mm -hmm. kind of butcher it and say it both ways periodically. Um, the ripsalidopsis are the ones we call Easter cactus or spring cactus, and the some are the Thanksgiving or Christmas cactus. Um, there's a really great website, uh, slumbergera.net. This is a registry for hybrids of the slumbergera and ripsalidopsis genus and um, these uh, this is a great site to get information about cultivars about the various hybrids about the species the history of it the whole nine yards if you so if you want in-depth information this is actually the international um, body that takes care of registering new hybrids and there's also one of those for epithetic, uh, uh, some of the other epithetic cacti, but this is for that, that one. Um, they are a, uh, the ones I'm talking about tonight, they are part of a broad group of, like I said, tropical cactus. And these grow in either the crook of a tree, which makes them epithetic, or maybe on a, the side of a rock face in a crack in the rock, and then they're ly lipophytic. Uh, they're not a parasite. They do not grow off of the tree. They grow on it, and they use it to kind of gather their nutrients in that crook of the, the tree. They survive on, in the wild on nutrients uh, provided to them in leaf litter, from moss, bits of windfall, and soil. And these species originate in various tropical and subtropical environments. So there is a lot of variety in the, the ancestry of these plants, and some of them do very well in dry environments. Some of them need a lot more water than others. Some of them need more sun than others. And a lot of times you just have to move them around your house or your yard to find the right spot where they do the best. Because if it's failing on you, you might have it just in the wrong spot. Um, some growing requirements, and these are all things to keep in mind if you're growing them yourself. Um, they need good air circulation around the plant. And I was talking earlier um, uh, about with somebody about the fact that if you have it too near your heat register in the house, it can dry them out a lot faster than over the winter months. So maybe move it to a cooler spot in the room if it's looking like it's not doing so well. Um, if they need good light, dappled or indirect light is best. In my house I'm currently in, I have several skylights. And they do wonderfully in the light from the, the diffused light from the skylight. Is that all here? Um, yeah, I, most of these will go outside during the during the winter. Keep, keep them outside and then bring them in in the winter if there's not any direct sunlight, but there's, but there's light down there. Yeah, they still need the indirect light. You may have to keep an eye on them and see how they adjust. Yeah. And, and see if they're, if they're, if they're not thriving or if they're at least not stable. And they start to kind of deteriorate on you. Got to move it to a ground. You probably can turn the spot. Um, they grow well if they have an adequate supply of water. They're tropical, but they don't like to be soaking wet. They like to be moist. Um, but if they, if you have them in a in a, in a saucer, and uh, they're sitting in that saucer of water, they can get root rot really easy. So you want to make sure if you do water them and there's water in the saucer, that you dump the water out of the saucer. Not as big of a problem here as what I would have, say, like where I was in San Diego, because it was more humidity there. 
in our lower humidity here, you may not even have that problem. Everything evaporates so quickly anyway, just in the dish. But just FYI, watch for that. Um, Nutrient-wise, um, they uh, like a slow, steady release of nutrients because uh, we're growing them in, under what, not exactly artificial circumstances, but um, uh, nitrogen supply is the most critical factor for, for blooming, especially. Um, and it can be depleted easily. So you have to, I think, replace soil. I, I do about every five years. Um, I, I fertilize them uh, and then I replace the potting soil. Um, and you want a, a mix that's uh, got organic matter in it and should it have slight acid pH. Um, it should, and the, the mix should be porous. The water should move through it readily. And you want a well-developed root system to promote blooming. That's partly why I stuck three, three in the same pot. Um, where I was growing them before, where that plant was going to get, get really, really big, really fast, and just that one plant that was in it. Um, I, but I like having them, them having crowded roots. But if you put several different kinds in the same pot, eventually one of the ones may be more dominant and take over the pot. And then, so watch that as, you, as they get bigger, you may have to then separate them out in the separate pot. This is the difference between them. If you've seen the um, holiday cacti, uh, there are, is the Easter, or the Christmas cactus is the one at the top. That one has no little spiny edges. And they're not because they're spiny, they're pointy. Um, the one at the top is grenaded along the edge. It's smooth relatively. And the bloom is um, symmetrical. It's actinomorphic. Uh, it is even, uh, an even bloom. The Thanksgiving cactus, the one in the middle, is the one that we mostly see in the stores these days. And that one is the is uh, mostly derived from the species, the truncata species of Slumbergera, and that's zygomorphic. It's an asymmetrical flower. So when you look at it from the side, it looks like it's stair step, and it's got like a it looks almost like it's a wing. And um, they're asymmetrical, and that's uh, you used to see a zygo cactus. They used to call it zygo cactus. Yeah, you'll still see that on labels sometimes. Oh, and then the third one, sorry, is the Easter cactus. And the Easter cactus, when you look at it real closely, it's kind of hard to tell in that little picture there on the um, to the right there. But it's also got the the symmetrical flower, different looking flower than the other ones, and it's got little teeny tiny hairs on the tip of the stem segment. And that's one of the clues that you've got an Easter cactus and not um, a, a Christmas cactus, plus the fact that it blooms in the spring. Right on the very tip. You barely see them in that picture. I had a the one right on the left. Um, the one, the bottom picture, and the the stem shown there on the um, left, in direction and challenge on the left. Um, okay. And you can see just barely. You can just barely see the little hairs on the tip. Yeah, I can. You, I can. I say, a few yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I don't have one of yeah. those with me to bring in. Um, why did Thanksgiving become Christmas? That's everything. You see in the store, they call them Christmas cactus. They're holiday cactus or Christmas cactus. They're actually not the original old-fashioned Christmas cactus. What you're seeing is um, cactus that are throughout, uh, sold now, calling them holiday cactus or Christmas cactus. But they were there's been a change, a shift in the in the um, the I guess in the sales of them marketing and the. Thanksgiving type cactus, the Suncata hybrids, are more upright. They package much easier. They get shipped much easier. They don't break. There, there's much less loss to the to the sales uh, whoever selling. So merchandisers want their products in the stores. Also, well before Thanksgiving, they bloom for about seven to eight weeks. So they show up at Thanksgiving. They sell them all the way through Christmas. When the true Christmas cactus blooms, it actually blooms the latter part of December and into January. So, and it also has a, uh, the Christmas cactus, the true one, has a um, pendant growth. It grows down more, and it's more easily broken in transit. 
So there's been a shift over the last oh, maybe 30, 40, 50 years to the point now that we're only seeing the Chancata hybrids and not the Lesbiana hybrids, which would be the true Christmas cactus. And this is the difference between them, how they look. One on the right is a Truncata hybrid called Youth, and the other one is a Sombergera Buckleyi, and the Buckleyi group is a hybrid of the uh, a cross between the Truncata and the uh, uh, Rusliana species that gave rise to what was your great grandmother's old-fashioned Christmas cactus that was in the park. Yeah, and it roots down and yeah. yeah. But when I have one that it, it, it's a Christmas cat, it's it's tender. Mm -hmm. But not every year, but some years it'll bloom around Thanksgiving and bloom the latter part of the year. Uh, is that just a fluke? Or it, it's a fluke. Um, you know, I've had them I've had them put out a bloom in the middle of June. I mean, and, and it's part of it is they have an incredibly complex ancestry. These things have been backbred and crossbred, and and they've got all sorts of not I want to say oddities, but they've got all sorts of variety in their in their genetic background. So you're just seeing one part of its its, its history kind of exerting itself. And they also sometimes when they bloom really 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 well one year, they don't bloom so good the next year. And that's also, I'm going to, I'll, I'll show this on, I'll, after I talk a bit more, I'll go up and show you on the one I brought in. You level back the stems and you get rid of the, because once it's bloomed at one of the stem segments, it typically does not bloom again at that same location. So it's a, it's a dead aerial. And it won't necessarily put out a new, uh, a new flower at that location again. So you have to, sometimes you have to kind of pinch them back to encourage new growth. And then once you get that new growth coming in, then you get you get a better bloom the next year. Do you do that right after blooming? Yeah, pretty much when you're pretty sure it's done. Um, they're fall and wintering blow, uh, growing for us, the, the Slumbergeras. They're native to Brazil, but of course they bloom in May there. And they're called Flor de Mayo in, in uh, Brazil. Um, naturally, their colors of red, Rose, purple, lavender, peach, orange, green, white. They've been and they've been bred back and forth with each other so much that you know who knows on some of the older ones like what you're going to get. Um, uh, they do well in hanging baskets or on plant stands. Uh, I've known people that have tried to grow them in the ground, uh, like when I lived in San Diego, and I was like, no, I don't think that. They don't. They don't do well like that unless you're like like I don't know, like a planter box where they can do where they kind of break down. And the colors varieties or just variations? No, they're varieties. They're they're different hybrids. Yeah. Or in some cases they're the species. Um and like uh about seven to eight weeks in, in length for the blooming uh, session. Um they uh, I mentioned the thing about the zygocactus. And zygocactus is really a descriptive name. It was the um, uh, official name uh, with the taxonomists for a long time, but in 1953, they changed the genus name to Clumbergera. So Zygocactus is one of its um, synonyms. But it's but it, it, it still, folks still call it that. Um, and these are the six species that are true Clumbergera, currently uh, categorized as such. Um, there's the Truncata, which is the oldest one in, that's been in use. And then there's the Rusliana, which was brought to, to Europe uh, in the 1830s. Um, others were, were found at different times, up to the most recent one was um, described in 1991. And then there's not all agreement that the last three that I have listed there, the last three lines, are actually in Slumbergera into that genus. Um, you know, whether you're a lumper or a splitter when it comes to taxonomy, things get moved in and out of the group and, you know, one, one decade they're in and the next decade they're up, you know, things that way. Um, there's still discussion about whether the, uh, those two subspecies I have listed there, the Lucia and the Brady Eye, are, should be in Clomidia, not everybody agrees. And there's several of the Hataora 
um, ones, the, I don't know if you're familiar with the Talent Talent Ladies, it's the um, Dancing Bones, that's what they call it, dance, that's the common name, one of the common names. Um, that one, some people say, should be in Slumber Jura. Some people that say that the Easter Cactus should actually be in Slumber Jura too, but mm -hmm. currently it's not. Um, and I've got a few pictures just to show you the differences in some of, of what they are. This is one of the Thanksgiving hybrids, the Trompata. Um, and then the Rusliana, this is a, a photograph, or not a photograph, a drawing from, 19, from 1839 of the Rusliana that was used with the Trompata to give us the, the Christmas practice way back in the 1840s. And depending on whether they've got more of the genetics of one or the other, you get variation, a little bit of variation in what, what it actually puts out in the way of the flower. Um, but the S. Buckleyi uh, hybrids are the ones that we think are the original Christmas plant. Oops. Here's another picture of a Rusliana. This has got the more even flower. Again, the stems you can see there are have the crenated edges. They're smaller, and the one I have up here on the table that I brought with me, that one is one from a friend of mine's mother. So that we think the plant's probably 60 to 70 years old. And she gave me a good sized plant, and I brought it over here with me, and the plant started dying back. Mm -hmm. But I had all this new growth that had come up from the bottom of it, and that's what I have there is the new growth that grew since I got here in uh, 2021, and, but the plant had been a fairly good sized plant, but all that died back. So the only thing I had left was the, the basal growth that had come up from below, which I'm hoping is going to be hardy enough to survive this. So I'm hoping I get to have one like your job coming. Maybe not in my lifetime, but I'm going to try. More fertilizer. Yeah, more <laughs> fertilizer. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, and the blooming period again uh, for for the for the Rusliana is basically February to April. So you combine that February to April growing period with the one that typically grows or blooms in uh, say November to the end of December, and then you get these things that then were blooming in January and February. When you uh, fertilize, what do you use? Um, I use something that's got low nitrogen. For to promote blooming, yeah, uh, yeah, fifty three and a half phosphorus. And then in particular, though, nothing, no, not, not, no brand in particular. Um, but basically, if you just use a balanced fertilizer, that's usually good enough. But but if you really want to try, would it feel like you would have done it? Um, not really. No, because okay. it just drains. Because if you if you've got a good enough draining soil, it, it doesn't stay stay with it. Um. But you know, you, you or you do if it's a liquid fertilizer, I do it weekly, weekly. You know, like it's not strong, but every week. Oh, okay. yeah, like yeah. dilution. Yeah. yeah. Um. So from the 1950s, there was a all year, all year round. Pardon? All year. No, yeah. After the blooming finishes, I go to back to a balanced fertilizer. Oh. But I use a slow release because I've got too many plants. Mm -hmm. I don't use a um like a where I have to go back every week. I I try to you know. Have something that releases. Um, let's see, what was I say? Oh, the, in the 50s, um, we got back to breeding. There had been a lot of breeding in the 1850s, and then they they fell out of um, they fell out of, of popularity, and so you didn't really find them a lot. And then in the 1950s, hybridizing of these took off in um, Europe, North America, Australia, New Zealand. Um, crosses were produced using the new ones that have been found and as well as the older ones. And more recent crosses has, have involved some of the more recently discovered uh, plants, especially Orsiciana and uh, Oplutioides. And uh, I've got a picture of the Oplutioides that looks like an Oplutia, with stem almost. Um, let's see. Uh, and, and there was no true yellow. And the yellow, we think, uh, when it was first introduced in 1985, the first yellow that was sold commercially of the um, holiday cacti um, was probably um, through uh, an induced mutation to use a chemical. Mutants were like colchicine. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Colchicine is one is one of the suspected, mm -hmm. you know, that they use. 
Um, here's a buckley eye, again, a, a Christmas cactus. And this is the, what the Microspira Sericea looks like. And so that's in some of the, potentially in some of the ancestry of these. So that's why you get some kind of weird stem sometimes, or um, a flower that, you know, is kind of off or looks different, or, you know. And, and they're looking for something new and unusual and different in the hybridizers. And so that's what you see coming out a lot of times, especially not so much in like at Osuna's nursery or at Home Depot, but if you go to some of the, with the breeder nurseries and, and get some more special stuff. But this is the, what the Opuntioides looks like. I wish I had it. I don't have it. I have a field that they photo from the website. This looks like a hybrid too. Yeah, but it's, but it's not. That's a species. Yeah, and that, and that's what I find that with a few times that I've had some of the species, they they fizzle on me. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're, they're well, no, not blockheads. I mean, they they've got um the aerials and they're spiny. Oh yeah. yeah, some of them can. Yeah. Some of them are spinier than others. The Christmas cactus not so much, but some of the other epiphytes. Um, this is the Orthiana. And you see where now they're breeding. They used to get the, the showier bloom because this is a real flowery, real kind of fancy bloom. Um, this is the Cogsii. That's the most recent one that has been described. It's not a new one. And then these are the ones that, that this is a true yellow, but one of the reasons why they think that this one, and some people feel that this one shouldn't be in Schlumbergera, is it's really hard to cross. And I don't know that they've been successfully crossed. With any of the other ones. So there's supposition that maybe it doesn't belong in Slumbergera and maybe it needs to go back to Hataora where it was before. If, if they use uh, the chemical, then you can see if they can double the chromes. Yeah. yeah, they can do the polypoidy thing and, and make them double up and. Two weeks ago, I would have learned how to figure out a good name talk. Um, anyway, this is a Brady Eye, another one. Um, and what I've got here just coming up is just a few photographs from my garden. Um, and this is one of my favorites, the Pandora. Uh, and these are the names that you see on the tags from the store is their hybrid name. And the collectors want to collect, you know, all the different ones. And Angel Dance and Caribbean Dancer. Um, anything, there's a whole bunch of them that have Dancer in the name. And that's, it, you can tell that they're done by the same um, propagator, the same nursery uh, group. So, and, the, and there's a bunch of them called Angel something, or uh, Amazon something, or, you know, they, they just got these different names. The wine tag really amazes me because there's no trace of grass. Right. Or even the, or the rest, the rest stuff gets so many whites, and they're, they're too, too low of a temperature. If you have them above 65 degrees, supposedly they would not get to get the red tree. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, you, so you can sometimes you can identify the hybrid, but not often. This is one called Senorita Leica. Hybrids patented? Yeah. Well, they're not. They're not exactly. They're not exactly patented. I mean. They're registered, and and I, I know we we didn't ever have any trouble. I mean, I was in clubs where we were trading and propagating and using them to make our own, and the whole they hadn't quite gone to the whole patented thing. Someday they might. Yes, it's so easy to make. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, these these vegetative reproduction is like that's how we do it. I mean, uh, that's what we did is we traded them all the time. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, in, in, uh, in Brazil, it's hummingbirds. In, in, in nature, it's hummingbirds. Mostly. Although there may be some moths and stuff. These stay open for several days. But, you know, typically um, it's, it's um, hummingbirds, I believe. In case like the name like is familiar, the name the first dog that was known as space by the Russians. Ah. <laughs> well, and some of these guys, like the Thor Sophia, Thor, anything with Thor in the front is uh, bred by a nursery in Denmark. 
So that, that so, so there's a clue in the name sometimes. And this is a I have this one. It, it's a gorgeous <laughs> uh, peachy orange. Um, this is that you again. That, that, that's the red I was referring to. Yeah. 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 And, and depending on your environment, you can get some variation in what it looks like. Yeah. And, and my greenhouse, too. This is Izzy for Bella. Samba. There's a bunch of sam samba ones. And oral. And now I'll talk a little bit, um, to kind of wrap things up a little bit about the Easter cactus. Um, these are a spring cactus. They're sometimes called uh, Easter cactus, Whitson cactus. They bloom from part, uh, here approximately from March until May. Um, it was previously in Hataora, uh, but now it's and, it, and it's been in Slumbergera. Currently, it's in Ripsalidopsis, is the genus. Um, so who knows? Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, you know, next week it'll be back in one of the other ones. Um, there's only two uh, species in this genus. And here's one um, of the red ones, kind of reddish one. And you see that in, in the drawing there, you can see on the tip how it shows the tip of the, the stem segment. It's got little teeny hairs on the on the segment, and that's what you look for to, to tell the difference in the Easter cactus. Plus, it's bigger than the um, Christmas cactus, the, the stem so segment. You see the hairs go into red colored boxes. Yeah. No. Sometimes the hairs the are much yeah. bigger. Pardon? The petals here are much bigger. Correct. In, in this building, would you still take that back? If you want to, if you want a new flush of blooms next year, because all wherever, wherever you see a bloom, it's almost guaranteed to not bloom again at that location. Okay. So when you when you pinch it back, you pinch it back to something that that um, is going to hopefully then branch off and give you two new stem segments for new growth. You may still have kind of a reduced number of blooms for next year. But you're getting ready for them the following year. So if you have that plant right there, where would you make your first pinch? Um, exactly. Yeah, back a couple of stem segments. Oh, we just we just cut a couple of stem segments. Yeah, yeah I just I just go back one or two. I'll show it here on this one when I see you. Know, yeah. If you could go back to that picture for one second, and raise another question. That looks to be a terracotta pot. Hmm. And the two that you have are ceramic. Is spot an issue with with the plant? Here, not so much, but where you live with there's higher humidity, it can be, um, because and and things dry out a little faster in terracotta. And I used to keep most of my stuff in plastic. As much as I hate using plastic for anything, um, <laughs> uh, it, I plastic they, they tend to contain more water or more moisture. Um, but yes, yeah, and also in ceramic. They, they do, but the because the terracotta is porous, they will dry out faster. That's the main issue. Yeah, and well, the, and the, the it, yeah, it leaches out the minerals faster into the pot. Well, by putting the terracotta pot in like the bag, it's like probably getting root uh, um, getting root rot, right? Yeah. No, well, you won't you won't have as much problem, but then they dry out so fast that you're watering them well. Yeah. That's the main thing. And it is quite likely that that plant is sitting in a plastic pot in that terracotta pot. <laughs> is what I would think. <laughs> yeah, I was just saying, yeah, it doesn't have the, the salting and the leaching going on. <coughs> the uh, the Salodopsis, there's only the two, the two species, one's red and one's pink. But we have oranges and pink and uh, oranges and yellows now. So it's probably again that chemical mutation induced um, changes or if, if you like group salt up so that there's a little bit of if there's a nose tree on the wrong one, about two miles from the top of the wheel, that at each of my gets in all the colors, about four to six of them. For for really good parts. 
chapter 12, verse 15. And the Lord is with his father. Is that? Green. 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 Yeah. Green. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same clockwork. This year, they, they, they've had an amp freeze. Mm. I, I, I couldn't, you know, and, and Yeah. Body. And and to get a nice big pot of them, I usually get like three or four and put them in the same pot of the same color. And and then I I, I would get my I would get my pot to a bigger point point because they like to be not so much root bound, but they like to have crowded mature roots before they'll bloom. And the and the pot likes to be full of roots. Um let's see. Uh see their seeds again, they're they're kind of shrubby, uh the stems are segmented. These flowers are um Nearly regular. They're, they're more regular than the uh, Thanksgiving type of the Sombrajira, uh, but not like the rest of the honor, which is very regular. So there's some irregularity. They're more regular than, as far as the, the shape and balance of the flower. Yes. Something like that. Yeah, a much shorter too than the other. Oops. Okay. Ah, I'm stuck, Stephen. What did I do? I, I froze me up. Hello. I'll keep talking. Um. Anyway, so the next few pictures that I got are are basically some some variations in what you can see for sale. Of these, yeah. Uh, these yeah, I would, I would, I would hang these. Although I have had less good luck growing the spring cactus, the Easter cactus, than I now have with the summer zeros or the um, of the toes. I am, um, um, I've killed more of these than I care to think about. <laughs> um, and but I, I keep trying because I, I love the ones that keep on. I had, I had a fairly good uh, luck with the flowers. There's an orange one that was doing pretty well for me. But I felt so bad when I left San Diego. I had to, I had to, I had to give a Here's a white one of the Easter variety. Um, an orange, this one's called Linda. Columba. I've seen all these at uh, at Greens. Yeah. And and some of these you can you can order a lot of them online, but they show up and they're just these tiny plugs and they're not so big. You you get these three segments or something. Yep. At Greens you can get a plant like this. Right. Uh, Savannah. Yeah. This one's called. I don't know if I got the name on this one. Oh, this, is, this one I have the name on. Um, let's see. I think I've already talked about that. This one's called Nelson Mandela. <laughs> but look how much longer those those petals are on that one. Well, it's because they're kind of hidden, and some of them are hairier than others. Yes, they're there. The ones that probably really yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Did that have a red? No, it's a red. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Red. Oh, yeah. Okay. They're getting just the right light. Yeah. It gets too red, it, it may be getting too much light. Yes. And there's, yeah, you see that the, the hairs on the ends of those are obscured by the blooms that are there. Yeah. This is another one. This is one of mine. What was that last one? And another one of mine. You can see kind of see the hair from that a little bit. Um, and if you see the red growth, don't don't dismay. It can mean that it's gotten a little bit more sunlight. You know, can succulents turn red? You know, these do that too. Uh, it's healthy plants still. Um, Oh, you can see, but you can see the back part of the plant's more green because it wasn't in, in as much sun. And 
but biologically, the, the red color is always there. But if you increase the light intensity, right, the green gets faded because the plant doesn't need that much light to donate any food, so the most of the red color comes up. So right. This is the record of the fall foliage stuff. Right. And and a, a lot of times your new growth sometimes not so much on the Christmas cactus, but on epiphytes in general on my epiphyllum hybrids, um, the red stems are also sometimes new growth. And sometimes exposure to coal will cause them to turn a little more red than they might want to Um and uh growing wise, you want to use porous soil, slightly acidic, um, although the acidity is 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 kind of eh, it's not that big a deal. Oops. In, now we got it on the my experience. Yeah. That if you don't worry about the acidity, two years later we're all dead. Well, and that's why it's... I always water with with uh, tablespoon of vinegar. Oh. And, and there's no calcium in anything in the soil. Well, and that's also why I change my soil every few years too. Yeah. Yeah, you never should. <laughs> Right. Here, you put the Yeah. Yeah. And and again, again, where I was growing these mostly was like in San Diego, water was awful there. It's very alkaline and a lot of salt in the water because it's all shipped in. Um, yeah, so so the slight acidity can help, and that uh, that's because they come from tropical environments where you have more acidity. There's something I noticed about these Christmas jackets that are in stores in every year. They use the, the coconut porter stuff. In, yeah. In, in the in the pot, nothing else. So and all that that does is support the root. Right. So if you use the, the, the coconut stuff and 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 use vinegar and water to to water the your plant you're, you're you're to be fine. You're good to go. Yeah, I, I typically in my potting soil I use um, either a cactus cactus mix or a um, or just a regular old potting soil. I add perlite, uh, small orchid bark sometimes, or coconut fiber chips, whatever, um, and that's kind of my mix. And I vary it. Some days I get one and not the other, and I would just keep a Trash can in the backyard with, uh, with with what I'm mixing this week. Um, uh, Azalea chameleon mix is pretty good because it does have a little more acidity to the to the soil uh, as far as a, um, a potting soil is concerned. And if you use cactus mix, well, and this was geared more for like in San Diego, where um, if you had too much sand in your mix, it was really too dense there because of the higher humidity. Here you can handle a little more of the sand in the soil because we're drier here. So um, yes. Are you having problems with soil because you have forest bark? You know, bark and stuff in it, it's breaking down and and it's stepping out. I don't think so. I mean, because I don't put a heck of a lot of that. Okay. It grows through just to keep the soil kind of fluffy. Yeah. You know, so I don't I don't do a lot of that. Mostly I do potting soil and fertilizer. Yeah. You know, and or the core. They don't. They don't. Yeah. No. They don't like concrete. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> At all. Yeah, yeah they're, 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 they literally are in like moss and leaf litter, and they really don't have any of this going on. So, you know, so we've got like a we're creating this artificial environment for them, and we're trying to grow them like regular plants, and they don't need that. They're epiphytes. You know, they can grow just off there. I mean, I've had them. I've had them where I was just laying them out on the on the on the edge or the, on the shelf in the backyard, and they come out and the darn thing's rooted. You know, and it's, and it's not even in a pot. So in San Diego, not here. Well, yeah. What if it comes from a low grade fall area? Well, it, it, that's just it. There's such variety in their ancestors. Right, right. You might have one that is okay with the drier condition. But you just don't know until you like played with it a little bit and figured out where where it grows best. Oh. And, and I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, chill the shoot like like me and the Easter cat. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and so some of these, you know, like my my epis are fine down to, you know, near freezing. Um, in fact, it wasn't until we just got into the splatters like this cold snap that that I really was worried about them um, at all. But so even down to like the upper 30s, it's not, they're not tough. They don't be bad. No, no. Okay. no. Is that true for all of them? Uh, not all. No, I mean some of them are more are, are more tender than others. And you just you have to know your hybrid. You have to know your plant. And and so I would be cautious with it at first until you kind of figure out what it can tolerate. And always have a backup plan. I mean, I always started. I always have a new one started. Kind of if it's one I really really want to. Um, anyway, so this is kind of my you know another discussion of soil. Um, and what stimulates flowering? Um, you know, these come from the tropics, and so. You know, photo, photo period like day and night. Um, but some people swear, especially the old, the old tales, the old wives' tales of the Christmas cactus, is that you got to put it in the closet for a month. You got to hide it from the light, and that's what people would be told. You got to put it in the dark. It's like I never used to put mine in the dark, and they were they're just fine. So it's like it doesn't really need that that darkness. What what, what it needs to decrease in daylight. Right. So, so you see, right. Yeah. And so it's 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 the length of day and the and night seem to be more changeable. Right. Yeah. So so that seems to have something to do with them setting by, as well as chill hours or at least getting some some cool in their to in their cycle. So it, a, a lot of times, if you keep them too too warm and too happy and too um, like there's no stress in their lives. Uh, they don't pull, they don't bloom as well. They, they like a little. They like that change in the light. They like that change in the temperature, and and so that'll help them set those as well. Um, and so that's that little bit of stress. I mean, you know, and there's so there's a wide range of these, and like I said, their ancestry varies. So and where they came from originally. We don't know like, unless we know like the, the species. We know where they came from with these hybrids. Who knows what the what they've been fed to get? Germany, Czechoslovakia, Poland. Yeah. Are any of them overly sensitive to heat? Yes. Some some more so than others. Yeah. It's just, and again, it just depends. Um. So they they grow best in in light shade or uh, dappled light, indirect light. Um. Especially here, they do not tolerate noon direct full sun. That will fry them immediately almost. Um, ideal spring and summer growth temperatures are between 70 to 80 degrees. That's kind of a general idea. Uh, they can tolerate hotter, hotter temperatures, but you got to give them a little bit more water. And, um, and, and also, if, you, if, you, if, they're, if they're too warm, they can drop their buds if they, if they get too stressed. All those buds that you were hoping to have to bloom the next year may drop, and they, or they may not really materialize. So what do you do when it gets above 90? Oh, water, and I make so sure they're in the safe. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just make sure they they don't they don't dry out. Um, and how I was going to show a little bit about about I can show you if anybody wants to see um, leveling back the stem, and then that means just pinching back a, a couple of the stem segments back onto the plant. Pitching back to there to promote new growth. Um, and avoid extreme temperatures, crowded mature roots to promote bloom. And um, if you really want to kind of give them a boost, uh, a low nitrogen fertilizer, two to three months or so before blooming season. And then after blooming, just a, a balanced fertilizer. And here's some for answer. This is a uh, uh, year. Uh, I'll give you an idea of the difference in the in the seed pods, of the sizes of them. Look at the slumber jura seed pods. They're little teeny tiny things, about that thing there. They're not very big. And you can see what you know, or how what a, how big a dragon is. Yeah, there's all these little red red berries almost. Looks like. Um, and they're subject to the same things that most plants, epiphytic plants, get. Um, the, the biggest problem I've had here is, is, uh, scale. I'm always cleaning scale up in dark times. And I think that comes in my soil sometimes. But, um, 
anyway, and there there is a lot of uh, work out there. There's a lot of literature on viruses, and um, sometimes parts of the plant will just die, and we don't know why. Who knows? Um, and uh, there's vi there's viruses that affect the bloom, and there's viruses that affect the stem. And viruses, not everybody agrees, but um, viruses are believed to spread uh, mostly by grafting and by having um, not cleaned your clippers in between cuts. Um, but some people think insects do uh, move the viruses throughout the plants. Not everybody agrees on that. But um, the definite clippers, and we know that grafting uh, has, has led to viruses spreading among the section. With a, a edema, that, what, what is that looking like? Edema is kind of a modeling, it, 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 and, and it's almost like blistering. And you get that with edema? When the plant has been too wet for too long. It may, it may have survived the wetness, but it causes the stems to have too much water in them. And then, and, and sometimes the blisters are kind of like hot, or, so it'll still it'll be fine. It can. Plants still both blooms and still good, but. Um, yeah, I was going to say bless it and chuck it. <laughs> it you know, um, it's it's uh, virtually, yeah, virtually, yeah, um, yeah, it's uh, uh, black rot. Um, and that's one thing. It's like sometimes you look at your plant and you think, oh, it's rotting, and you pull it out and it's just been dry. You know, and it gets wrinkles because it's dry. When the plant starts wrinkling and gets blacker and blacker and blacker, you probably have black rot in your roots or something. And uh, so that's that's kind of so they're they, you know they're subject to the the garden variety bugs and pests. Um, I I never had a problem with spider mites, although I've seen careful. You're gonna have it now. Now I will. Um, well, I've noticed I'm having more of that here than I had where I used to live. Yeah. No. I, like I said, I've I've mostly been fighting um, scale. More than anything, um, and then and then this is more about the just the the, the temperature thing. Um, you know, if you're in a really really dry part of the state, uh, you might try using misters, but that can be tough because you don't want to promote rot, uh, have them to be too wet. I mean, they are some people call them jungle cacti, but um, you know they should tolerate heat fairly well. If you give them enough shade and, and a proper humidity or, or enough water in the soil. And you, you've basically got to create a microclimate that provides the shade, moisture, and conditions that they need to survive the higher temperatures. And, and that holds true then also for the winter months. Um, they are not frost tolerant. Um, if they get too cold, depending on the, the hybrid, the stems turn mushy like any succulent, and they get wilted and limp and turn black, and it sells up, and you're done. Um, you can prevent damage by covering them or keeping them in a protected area. Um, it, I have, I use a small heater in my greenhouse. Um, I don't. I try not to let it get too far down into the 30. So I set it at about 40. It's a small greenhouse. Although we'll see if I'm still married after uh, so many years of running that thing. Um, <laughs> well, for what it was worth, a couple of years ago, I gave a friend of mine a couple of uh, plants in a pot for a uh, Christmas time. And she liked them to run so far. And she called them and said, Let's be all done. Can't pick it up. So I did. Throw them all, went inside the house, forgot about it. It was in the winter. Went outside the next morning. There's a Christmas package sitting there frozen. Oh. I put it in the house. Turns out there are two plants there. One plant just shrunk over into a big pile of mush. The other one came right back. Yeah. It's just amazing. Yeah. This is part of my theory about cacti. They evolved in the temperate climate. Not yeah. in, not in. I don't, I don't, I wouldn't disagree with that. Mm -hmm. And, and a lot of these, like, what we would do is, is, um, one of the things I, I did for several years was I worked at the um, uh, San Diego Zoo Safari Park. We had a huge epiphytic cacti collection that our club took care of. And um, 
the the plants there sometimes it's up, it's up in Escondido in the northern part of San Diego and freezes there sometimes. We would turn the, the sprinklers on and run the sprinklers at the night on the when it got down to some temperature. But every once in a while things would freeze, especially around the edges of the of the greenhouse. And so you just leave the the frozen sticky part and it kind of actually protects the plant. Yeah. The 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 root ball. If the root ball doesn't freeze, you may get it to come back. Uh, especially if there's a little bit of green left or whatever. So don't despair. You might be able to bring something back from a from a freezing episode, but it could be tough. Um, and, and like I said, after a freeze, leave the damaged growth in place. You can maybe protect the plant enough and, and remove it later when warmer temperatures return. You can see what, what actually survives the same thing that you have. And then um, uh, they, they, they can tolerate temperatures down around freezing for a few hours. Uh, but a prolonged, even a mild freeze sometimes, or a heavy frost, or a brief hard freeze can kill plants. And again, it, it, a lot of it depends on the ancestry of the particular plant. And since you don't know exactly what your ancestry was, um, you kind of have to kind of see them all the same way and kind of maybe the ones that you don't know for sure are going to make. And even then, sometimes you can do that just as And I said the, the thank you there is to some of my uh, friends from San Diego, from the Epi Society there. And um, they they reviewed this and looked at it and showed some of the photos. And, and Ron Crane was our, our was our teacher guru who taught everybody everything. But um, that's that's got to be two different plants. Yeah, that's not my picture. I just I I photoshopped that one. <laughs> I took out the background, stuck it in the pot. So I don't know what the heck that is. Yeah. Anyway, that concludes my program. Um, and if you want to come up and take a look, and like I said, that, that little one there is that is the Christmas cactus, and it's a baby, so it doesn't, it's not as big as it's going to get, hopefully. Um, and then when you look at the other one, you can see the Oh, well, yeah, I can, I can, whoops. Well, I'm going to open up the camera so people can see you. What I was going to do is, like I've got this one here. This branch off, like this one has a branch off up here, and so I've got new growth up here. So if I was going to level this one back, I'd come back to this stem segment, and I and I level it off there. So hopefully I can promote some new growth there, so it comes out in both places. And this I'm just going to stick back in the pot and it. So you know that, and so that's that's kind of what what amounts to leveling off is is you know pinching back like. Two or three stem segments, mm -hmm. and then and then this this will root, and mm -hmm. you can either make your plant bigger or give it to somebody. Right. You mentioned that you change, you do change the soil. How often do you do that? Well, it's like um, Jake was saying. Some, some he doesn't change them. There's some that I've had in the same I, pot for ten I, years. I plant in the same pot. 40 years. Yeah, I mean, and as long as you feed them and take care of them and give them some nutrients, they're going to do okay for a long time. A lot of people don't, you know, they don't realize that they've depleted all the nutrients well, in their in the potting soil. Two, so if they're there's going two on, points. The pot could have a drain hole. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then you yeah. need to flush it like once the, a year. The so. push is yeah. super important. Uh, oh, yeah. No, I, none of my plants have closed holes. Everything has a drain hole in it. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Yeah.